The news of this hour begins in West Africa, where embattled Nigeria's former central bank governor, Gobin Emefile, has been granted bail in the sum of 50 million naira after being charged with 26 counts bordering on alleged abuse of office and irregular allocation of $4.5 billion and $2.8 billion naira, respectively. Emefile was admitted to bail with two shorties and like some by Justice Ramon Oshodi on Friday. Ramon Oshodi, the judge, in his ruling on the bail application on Friday, admitted Emefile on bail with two shorties and like some. On Monday, Emefile was arraigned by the federal government alongside Henry Omole, his co-defendant. Highlighting the bail conditions, the judge said the two shorties must be gainfully employed and have three years tax payment with the legal state government. The judge ordered the addresses of the two shorties must be verified. And to help unpack this, I'm joined live on the news by a legal practitioner, Justice Ojeno. Good afternoon. Glad to have you join me. Good afternoon to you and good afternoon to our listeners all across the world. Okay. Pleasure. All right. Now, could you provide an overview of the proceedings so far in this case against uh, Mr. Godwin Emefile, particularly regarding the allegations of, of abuse of office and also irregular allocation of funds? Okay, for me, I think that generally uh, the, the, the government has, has done everything that it's fairly expected to do uh, in this case. Of course, they arrested him, they brought charges against him, and the charges was made to plead guilty promptly. And of course, the bail the hearings came up, and the judge who has, has done his bit by giving what I think is a, is a very, very fair bail condition, especially against. Uh, the backdrop of the amount or the allegations that are, that are, that are preferred against uh, the former CBN government. But if he feels that he, he can't meet the bail conditions and our bills on him and his lawyers to actually apply to the courts to vary the conditions. But generally, I don't think the, the terms of the, of the bail conditions are, are onerous. Mm. Let's talk about the factors considered, you know, in arriving at the decision to grant a Mifile bail. Uh, what are the conditions of this bail we're looking at? Okay, for me, I think that one major factor that's considered is the fact that it is also on, on numerous other bills. Because now we even have a fatigue of, of following a Mifile's case. <laughs> I don't think, except it's a legal practitioner like me that is following all these cases, uh, if we are to use cheap balance, bumper to bumper, uh, they, they, they may not be able to say, okay, uh, this is exactly a case against him because they practically have lost count. So a number of cases have been against him. He must have dropped his passport at some point in, in the earlier cases. So that would be a major factor in the courts not saying he should drop his, his passport. So they feel that the courts might also have considered the fact that uh, there have been other conditions leveled, leveled against him in, in other courts. So, and, that, and it also another major factor is he hasn't uh, been, been problematic so far. He hasn't attempted to jump bills so far. So that would also have been a condition. Maybe the, the, the court also feels that he is not a, he is not a, a witness, that he is not a, a defendant that may want to tamper with the case. Because ordinarily, these are the things that the courts, because they feel that a suspect will go and tamper with the, with the witnesses, intimidate witnesses and all, the court will decline those. So I feel that the court must have, have, have done its own extremely due diligence with respect to, to, the, to the situation before giving them what I feel is a very, very fair bill condition. Well, if you recall, December 2023, Emefile was first granted bill of 300 million naira and then afterwards, uh, what we heard was he was unable to meet up with the bail condition. Now, going by this antecedent, do you see the EFCC, you know, honoring, you know, honoring uh, this bill if a Mayfield fulfills the conditions? I, I, I feel so. I, I feel so, and I, I honorably expect so in, in the interest of rule of law, because they also are an organization that are created by law. It will be uh, illegal and unlawful for them to attempt to not fulfill it, it, it for them to attempt to not, not have him released if it fulfills all the bill conditions. And of course, I expect that the Mayfield's lawyers too should, will have to maybe rely on the uh, what we call Forms 48 and 49 
uh, of the sheriffs and civil processes act to bring contempt charges against uh, the leaders of the EFCC if they do not uh, honor the terms. But generally, I feel that they will honor the terms because they actually eventually honor the terms uh, by releasing a Mayfele last year on the 22nd to go and enjoy Christmas when, when he successfully perfected, perfected his bill. So I expect, too, that even though uh, yeah, law, law, law enforcement agencies can be very, very funny at times, I, I expect that this will not be an outlier. Mm. But what other dynamics are we looking at here? What steps are anticipated to take place, you know, probably in the legal proceedings against uh, Mr. Godwin and Mayfield and his co-defendant, uh, Mr. Henry Omole? I, th I think it will be as plain as milk, actually. It will be, it will be straightforward because I don't uh, foresee any, any legal gymnastics because they've been at it, they've, they've done it repeatedly with respect to these other cases. So I just feel that there won't be any surprise. I, it's just uh, going to be straightforward. How would you assess the strength of the prosecution's case against Mr. Godwin Emefiele? And then what potential legal strategies do you anticipate the defense may employ moving forward? Okay, for me, that may be, that may be a very, very direct question that, that may be hard for me to, to answer, especially because of the ethics of our profession. And, but I, I will say this, the standard that is expected in all criminal trials is a proof beyond reasonable doubt. And the major, major job is for is on the side of the prosecution. They must ensure that they do a human's job because if they don't do a human's job, if there is any doubt or any any significant doubt, uh, it, it's the court's duty also unto the laws on our books, especially the Evidence Act, to let Mr. Mayfield go home uh, free and dry because uh, as we say in, in criminal prosecution, uh, we usually say that it's better to let uh, 99 guilty persons go home scot-free than to punish an innocent person. So that is why the standard is so high. So the work of the prosecution is really, really cut out for them. And I expect that this is a fair, a fair jury. And uh, or at the end of the day, the judges will land on the side of the justice of the case. So oh. the, the, the defendants here, yes, they have the, defend, the defendants, uh, lawyers, they have much to do too, but not as uh, surmounting as that of, of the prosecution. Well, time like they say will tell. We'll just have to wait and see how this uh, plays out. But thank you so much for your insight on the news. Justice Ojeno, legal practitioner, thank you once again. It's my pleasure. Away from that, Nigeria's crude oil production experienced a second consecutive monthly decrease, reaching 1.231 million barrels per day in March. This is as reported by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Country, OPEC, in its April 2024 monthly oil market report. Direct communication from Nigeria revealed a decline from February's production of 1.322 million barrels per day. This represents a significant drop of 91,000 barrels per day. January saw production at 1.427 million barrels per day, but this trend did not persist into February. The decline continued into March. OPEC's data underscores the downward trajectory in Nigeria's oil output, highlighting challenges in sustaining production levels. And now to security matters. Bandits are reportedly demanding five million naira as ransom for two kidnapped victims that were taken in Omogidi community in the Entakpa Council Ward in Otupo local government area of Benway, North Central Nigeria. Two farmers were said to have been killed and two others were injured. Locals said the deceased recently fled their homes due to a similar attack but decided to go to their farms in Omogidi when they were killed on Tuesday. The other three were also said to be on their farms when the bandits attacked them and took away one of them while the other two were reported to have been injured. Earlier, Chris Aquarando, a public commentator, spoke to us on these developments. Incident, but we need to ask ourselves, uh, where did rain start beating us? When did we get to this point? There are some remote causes uh, that must have led to these immediate issues. 
Uh, of course, we knew that uh, Benue has been a flashpoint. Um, you remember the Tiv Jukun situations and so on and so forth, but the farmers had us clashes. But the issue is, um, do we actually think about the remote causes of these issues before uh, we begin to discuss the immediate situations? The immediate causes, of course, could be traced back to uh, the fact that we, we've never bothered about creating citizens of our country. We have hyphenated citizens, and, and, and uh, so you have a situation in which people don't think about the country. They only think about their uh, social you know, relationships, their uh, religious relationships, their tribal relationships. Okay. Now, we have also should think about the role that state creation has played. When states were created, were we thinking about cohesion? Were we uh, thinking about cultural affinity? Were we thinking about people understanding themselves? Now, three, we must also be thinking about the issue of uh, indigenous settler situations. Indigenous who accommodated settlers. Where did the settlers go? Yeah, and still on security, troops of Operation Safe Haven have been urged to remain resilient in their task of maintaining security of lives and property within their areas of coverage in order to consolidate on the achievements so far recorded by the command. And these were the words of the Cheta Commander, Major General Abdul Salam Abubakar, during the 2024 launching with troops of the operation to mark the Eid Fitr celebration. She's about the only was there and now reports. This is the first time the commander of Operation Safe Haven is performing this function since assuming office in June last year. The event, among others, is to commend efforts of the troops in the discharge of their duties and also urge them to keep the flag of the Nigerian army flying, even in the face of adversity. Your professionalism, courage and determination to achieve our mandates especially on the plateau, is worthy of note and highly appreciated. While I acknowledge and applaud your efforts, I urge you not to rest on your oars or to remain focused in your task to consolidate the gains of all our recent achievements. For the recently fallen heroes of Operation Safe Haven while on duty in Mangu, Major General Abubakar said no stone will be left unturned in ensuring the perpetrators of the crime are all arrested. I have sworn not to rest until all those responsible are brought to justice. And thankfully, we have recovered their weapons and already arrested most of the perpetrators that are responsible, some as far away as Bauchi. Like I always say, you can only run and not hide it will get you. In the face of daunting challenges, the commander assured continuous motivation of troops, which is paramount if there's hope for efficiency in service delivery. The commander, who is also the general officer commanding 3 Amod Division Rukuba, and other senior officers present at the event, performed the tradition of serving the troops at the luncheon, while dance troops were also in attendance to entertain guests. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anyui. The spirits of wounded and recuperating soldiers were lifted today as the Nigerian army celebrated Adrian Fitri with a special luncheon and their honor in Maiduguri, capital of Bronu State, northeast Nigeria. Our correspondent, Umaru Kirawa, has details. A sense of gratitude filled the air at the Memalari Nigerian Army Barak Meduguri as soldiers came together to celebrate Idel Fitr with their injured comrades. Nigeria's chief of army staff, represented by the theater commander Northeast Operation Hadinkai, took the opportunity to express his admiration for the soldiers' selfless sacrifice, acknowledging the hardships they have faced in service to the nation. I challenge you not to rest on your arms as we continue to work with our sister services and other security agencies in implementing strategic policies of government 
through successful operational activities and effective tactical actions. I urge you that I will continue to prioritize your welfare while maintaining the sanction and reward system which characterize the sound administrative pillar of my command philosophy, which is to transform the Nigerian army into a well-trained, equipped, and highly motivated force towards achieving our constitutional responsibilities within the joint environment. He expressed the importance of unity and cooperation among soldiers, calling on them to remain steadfast in their commitment to safeguarding the nation and fostering peace in the region a view corroborated by other senior officers. We want to use the opportunity to bring together all our forces, including our civilian friends and our families, to enjoy, to forget at least what has been going on in the battlefield, at least to remember that a day like this will always be for us to celebrate despite the hard times. The Nigerian army pledged to continue with its counter-terrorism efforts to promote stability in the region while calling on Nigerians to continue to pray for their continuous success. In Maiduguri for New Central, Umori Kirawa. We have a story that is just breaking. Nigeria's controversial cross-dresser Idris Okunaye, also known as Bobriski, has been sentenced to six months imprisonment without an option of fine. He pleaded guilty to allegations of abusing the Nigeria's currency, the Naira, and Justice Abimbola Wugburu of the Federal High Court, Lagos, in a sentence, said a judgment will serve as a deterrent to others who are fond of abusing and mutilating the Naira. Bobriski has a right to appeal, but he will be spending the time while the appeal runs, if he decides to. Some Nigerians have blamed the high cost of food items in the market for the low turnout of citizens witnessed having a fulfilled Idri Mubarak celebration. Some of them who spoke to our correspondent in the nation's capital, Abuja, say the 2024 Salah celebration has been low-key as many Nigerians are battling to cater for their families in the midst of biting economic situation. Our correspondent, Babelos Obamanu, visited one of the suburbs of Abuja and found in this report. It is that time of the year when the market is filled with people buying one staple food or the other. Motor parks are usually filled with travelers visiting their families and loved ones to mark the Salah celebrations. But that has not been the case this time around. We are managing. God will help us. We are surviving. These have become the reoccurring comforting words in the lips of many Nigerians as they navigate through the tough times, hunger, poverty, in the face of depleting national resources. We are in the season of celebrating Salah, and many Nigerians are acclimatized to buying of chicken, goats, cooking of food, and sharing with their loved ones and their neighbors, while some travel, fun lovers and fun seekers converge on every entertainment point to celebrate with their family. But the sad reality is that these activities have reduced drastically, as many Nigerian families fight to provide three square meals a day. Surviving in Nigeria has now been left totally in the hands of supernatural beings, while some hope that manna will fall from heaven. The commodity in the market is so expensive that so many people cannot even afford eating three times a square meal in a day. Things, things they cost too much. Even the salad, the salad market will not sell, nobody. We not sell. See tomato what I buy since last week. It's still there here. For this market, we go carry it like 500, 400, 300, and we go sell all in one day for salad time. Then now, now we know, we know the bicycle like, like we go fast like 150, 200. As people, they talk to money, no they for the country. I came to this market this morning to buy a a small goat or whatsoever to celebrate with my family. 
the goods that we used to, the equivalent of that same good that we used to buy at the rate of uh, 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 50, 40,000. They are telling me 90,000 now. Some people blame the high cost of food to insecurity being witnessed in the country. These days, you know, farmers are no longer comfortable going to the farm because of the high, high rise in cases of kidnapping, Fulani headsmen, uh, robbery here and there, and so many of them. Although President Bola Tinubu has at several fora acknowledged that Nigerians are suffering and that the challenges will be for a short while, many will be hoping that he addresses the food crisis squarely to help ease the burden on citizens. In Abuja, for News Central, I am Marvelous Oboman. Let's now tell you that the Lagos State Government has ordered an immediate demolition of illegal buildings in Dusumo Market and its environs that failed its integrity test. The State Governor gave this order when he visited the site of the fire incident in the market, which affected about 14 buildings in total. Our correspondent, Adeshawa Odushoga, has details. It's the third day since the fire incident at the Dosumu market, and the fire won't stop burning. Smoke was still billowing in the sky, and more buildings were being brought down to allow for proper control of the inferno. <laughs> Commercial activities in the market have been stored. This is what the Dosumu market now looks like. This center used to be for traders and customers with a heavy presence of commercial activities. But after a fire incident about two days ago, costing 14 buildings, the market is now a shadow of itself and it's only left with smokes that is still blowing in the air even after three days. The traders here asking one question, where do we go from here? Now, this used to be um, one of the many market that were sold here in the Dosmo market. They are called trimmings. And then many traders here sell this in retail and in wholesale. And you can see them in the remnants of the collapsed building. And there are a lot more just like this. Earlier in the day, Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu visited the market, reiterating the resolve of the state to demolish buildings that failed its integrity test. The governor assured that the Dosumo market would be closed indefinitely, adding that the government would assist those affected. We will step on as many toes as possible. We're coming back. We're going to take down several buildings. We're going to take down all those attachments. All these extensions that you are doing, totally unacceptable. In response to this, market women affected by the fire and the proposed demolition in a cry for help are asking the government to compensate them for all they have lost in the process, asking that proper planning should be enforced to allow reopening and renovation of the market. <laughs> It's the fifth time the Lagos Island market will be experiencing a fire outbreak in four months. This has been attributed largely to carelessness, lack of enlightenment on safety precautions, and illegal construction of congested high-rise buildings, obstructing adequate access to forced responders in the case of such emergencies. In Lagos, for New Central, Adisha Wawudushoga. Thank you for staying with us. The news continues in West Africa when the Niger Republic has received Russian military instructors with an air defense system and other equipment as part of the West African nation's deepening security ties with Moscow. The Niger's military government agreed in January to step up military cooperation with Russia after expelling French forces that were helping to fight a jihadist rebellions in several Sahel nations. Russia will help install an air defense system to ensure complete control of air spaces. Niger has also joined neighbors like Mali and Burkina Faso, which are also ruled by military leaders after coups to create a joint force to battle long-running jihadist insurgencies.
And still in West Africa, Togo's opposition parties have urged people to massively attend demonstrations planned for Friday and Saturday in the capital, Lomé, to protest against a new constitution despite a ban by the authorities. Political tensions have been on the rise in Togo over the constitutional reform, which critics say is a bid by loyalists to keep President Fona Sigbe in power longer. The government delayed the legislative election on April 20th to give more time for discussions on the reform and set a new date of April 29th for the ballot. Minister of Territorial Administration Handobalu Awati has banned the rallies, saying the roots of the protest was illegal and their application for a permit did not meet a deadline. When I head to the east of the continent, where the United States pleaded Thursday for the war to care more about Sudan nearly a year into its brutal war and voiced hope for a resumption soon of peace talks. According to the U.S. Ambassador to the United States, Linda Thomas Greenfield, as communities barrel towards famine as cholera and measles spread and as violence continues to claim countless lives, the world has largely remained silent. She called for change that must happen now. The U.S. ambassador adds that the international community must give more, it must do more, and it has to care more. A long-running rift between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rap support forces erupted into an all-out war on April 15, 2023, leaving thousands dead, displacing millions, and severely derailing a fragile transition to civilian rule. Staying in the region, Police in the East Shower Zone have arrested 13 suspects over the shooting in Meki, where opposition figure Bate Ogesa were killed and buried. No details about the suspect were disclosed. The largest and most populous region of Ethiopia, Oromia, has been in the grip of an armed insurrection since 2018. The Oromo Liberation Front, OLF, renounced armed struggle that year, that year after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed himself an ethnic Oromo came into power, prompting the Oromo Liberation Army to split from the party. In Central Africa, Gabon's transitional president has asked his Ivory Coast counterpart for help in getting African Union sanctions lifted during a meeting in Abidjan. General Bryce Solege Ngwame, who came into power in a coup last August, met Ivory Coast President Alassane Ouattara during a visit to the country for work and friendship from Thursday to Saturday. According to the general, he's asking for support of his elder to plead in favor of lifting of the African Union sanctions against Gabon. Gabon was suspended from the African Union on August 31st after Nguami overthrew President Ali Bongo, whose family had been in power for 55 years. He pledged to hand back the oil-rich Central African country to civilian rule after two years transitional period. And to some health stories, Mozambique Health Authority says it intends to vaccinate almost 200,000 people against trachoma in three districts of the central Mozambican province of Manica. Trachoma is transmitted directly through dirty hands, utensils, clothes, or even towels that can pass from the eyes of a contaminated individual to a healthy person. Complications caused by this disease may lead to irreversible blindness. The districts in question are Guru, Tambara, Makosa, and all three have a prevalence of trachoma of 5%, a rate that the health authorities consider to be a public health problem. Trachoma is endemic and consists of five districts in the northern provinces of Nyasa, Nampula, and the central provinces of Zambezia, Manika, Tet, and Sofala. Zimbabwe has introduced Cabotegravir long-acting, an injectable pre-exposure prophylaxis drug to add to the HIV prevention in the country. The drug is an antiretroviral designed to suppress any infection as it occurs. It is administered to HIV-negative people who have a higher risk of becoming infected with the virus. According to the Ministry of Health and Child Care AIDS and TB program, Dr. Ida Moya, this intervention will be implemented in the demonstration site and later rollout of the Kabla in the whole country. The South African Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Ronald Lamola, has delivered a public lecture at the University of Johannesburg under the theme, Legal Education and its Role in Achieving Social Justice in South Africa. 
The lecture forms part of the 30 years of freedom with the objective to afford the law students a platform to engage and reflect on the state of legal education and its role in advancing social justice and participatory democracy in South Africa. The lecture is also in fulfillment of the department's objective to foster and harness relations with stakeholders from all sectors of the society, including the students. Bongani Ziba has more on this. And we can Students, academic and legal minds alike all best. gathered to delve into the transformative power of legal education and its crucial justice in the society. The minister insightful words resonated with those who recognize the impact they can make in shaping a more and just equitable society through their legal expertise. Social justice plays a significant role in shaping and re-engineering society law schools and the legal profession, just as the legislative and the executive branches are responsible for addressing policies aligned with our social justice agenda as outlined in the Constitution, it is crucial to recognize the profound impact of the curriculum on legal education and social justice. It is commendable that this faculty has undertaken the development of a module such as the Bill of Rights. And it highlights their commitment to fostering a, a deeper understanding of fundamental rights and promoting equality at both theoretical level and at a practical level. The minister also argued about the digital transformation of the Criminal Legal Act of South Africa. The advancements in modern criminology and penology have highlighted the necessity for a complete overhaul of the traditional concepts of responsibility for criminal acts and the methods of punishment especially where the legal community, including judges and lawyers, is yet to get grips and on implications of this type of approach. In fact, what we see is that there has been a tendency to resort overly to, to complex technicalities in criminal procedures, ultimately leading to a breakdown in the criminal justice system as a whole. With the, what the constitutional uh, uh, um, system has presented, has also led to delays in the criminal justice system. He urged the university to help society imagine the future and look at legal solutions that can be farmed. I hope institutions of higher learning could also study this phenomenon, where litigants can raise all various points which are within their rights, but these points do delay the conclusion of the processes in the criminal justice system. What is it that should be presented to ensure that there is an expeditious resolution of conflicts and disputes in the criminal justice system while still having those technical points. But the technical points must help enhance, expedite instead of delaying court procedures. For these students, the minister's lecture will serve as a powerful tool in their quest for social justice and equality. So my takeaway from the minister's lecture is that there is a need for dig digitalization in order to ensure that there is a broader access to justice for all people, even those that are not legal practitioners. At the same time, he realizes that there are cracks in our constitution. Our law is stuck into the center of the knot, simply meaning that we fail to actually understand and enhance a certain understanding of what our law is actually going through. For an example, when we think about an AI as an inevitable future, it's something that we need to enhance and integrate within our um, legal system. In practice, it might not look like it's the best uh, amongst the world, but in theory, we have one of the best constitutions and laws that protect almost every part of society. Yes. At the University of Johannesburg, for News Central, Wangani Siziba. Thai soldiers standing guard at the border and trucks waiting at the checkpoint. Following days of clashes that have dislodged junto troops from their positions in a vital trade hub in the neighboring country, fighting between Miyama's military and ethnic minority armed group has rocked the border town of Miyawada this week, sending people rushing into Thailand from where the boom of artillery shells and gunfire could be heard. The conflict in Miyama, backed by the military's 2021 coup, regularly sends people fleeing across the two countries' shared 2,400-kilometer border. A real estate tycoon, Trong Mai Lan, was sentenced to death by a court in Ho Chi Minh City in southern Vietnam in the country's largest financial fraud case ever. 
A top Vietnamese property tycoon was accused of embezzling $12.5 billion. Share of major developer Van Thiefart, Trong Mylan was accused of swindling the cash from Saigon Commercial Bank over a decade. The charges they face include bribery, abuse of power, appropriation and violations of banking law. And now for business news, let's connect with the business desk. Welcome to Business News. We begin in Nigeria, where the Debt Management Office, DMO, plans to raise 450 billion naira in its April bond auction, which will take place on April 15. This is consistent with DMO's plan to raise up to 1.8 trillion naira in FGN bonds during the second quarter of 2024. The DMO proposes 150 billion naira for the new FGN April 2029 five year bond. It would offer 150 billion naira for the reopened February 2031 17 year bond and 150 billion naira for the FGN February 2034 10 year bond. The auction will be held on April 15, while the settlement date is April 17, 2024. And moving on, the National Biosafety Authority, NBA, has clarified that it has not approved the cultivation of seeds for 14 genetically modified products in Ghana. Instead, the NBA, through its Chief Executive Officer Eric Amaning Kori, said it only registered the GM products for importation into the country for specific purposes such as food, feed or processing. The NBA has emphasized that it followed established procedures by the Biosafety Act 2011, Act 831 and international best practices in granting these approvals adding that there was sufficient public participation and consultation when it approved the products. Earlier, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture clarified that it has not approved the commercialization of 14 genetically modified maize and soybean products approved by the Ghana National Biosafety. The Ministry went on to state that the released products should not and must not be used as seeds in Ghana. And finally, the Zambian government has today launched the Demand Stimulation Incentive to support mini-grid developers as part of President Akande Hichilema's plan to accelerate mini-grid deployment through the 1000 Mini-Grid Initiative. It's been headed by the Rockefeller Foundation with support from JEEP and SE for All. This incentive aims to overcome barriers and increase energy access in Zambia. It will facilitate rural development by powering productive energy uses in communities lacking reliable electricity. The grant-based subsidy encourages mini-grid developers to connect small businesses and public institutions, spurring economic activity. Initially, the incentive will focus on 100 priority sites, benefiting 30,000 rural Zambians and electrifying schools, hospitals and community institutions. The 1000 Mini Grid Initiative aims to reach 1 million people, addressing energy access challenges and stimulating growth in key sectors. That's our offering on Business News at this hour. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasnami Peter. The Confederation of African Football, CAF, have included Nigerian referee Musa Dong Davu. Among the match officials for the ongoing Futsal African Nations Cup tournament, hailing from Plateau State, Davo is recognized as one of Nigeria's Futsal FIFA referees, having successfully passed the required fitness and medical tests, demonstrating his readiness for the competition. This appointment holds special significance as it marks a milestone in the history of Nigerian refereeing. The last time a Nigerian official served as a center referee in a Nations Cup game was back in 2006. A drought of 18 years. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. A high court has granted former CBN governor Godwin Emefile bill in abuse of office trial. U.S. solicits world's attention on crisis in Sudan almost one year on. Gabon seeks Ivory Coast assistance on lifting AU sanctions. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube.
Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba. Thank you.